In this video, we're gonna be looking at Square stock as a potential stock to add to our long-term investing growth portfolio. Now, obviously, because it is a fintech company, that it's very easy business model to understand. It's just a lot of dollars and cents. And, you know, we just need to make sure that we understand the valuation and make sure that it's not too overblown. Hey guys, it's Tanner Manson for Future Investing. And obviously, we are not in the regular, you know, green studio that I usually have. I'm not home right now. I am out and about for a couple weeks. But, you know, I, it, this is not too, too bad. You're just gonna have to deal with the book shelf and everything like this for the next couple of weeks, but I will be back to the studio eventually, but let's jump right into the video. I don't want to keep you guys waiting any longer. You know, I'm going to keep up to this, you know, content schedule, keep all your subscribers happy, everything like this. But before we jump right back into Square Stock, although I am actually a licensed financial security advisor as my full-time job, none of these stocks or topics that we talk about today are in any way my recommendation. This is merely my opinion and you can choose to do what you wish with this information. Now, if you could hit the like button down below and subscribe if you want to see more financial content just like this. First, let's just go over some main stock statistics right now so then we kind of get a feel for the valuation of this company. First off, Square is trading at about $250 a share, or as you should better put it, about $116 billion market cap. That's all the shares added up together, or you know, the proper valuation of the company. But whenever we look at it in terms of how much money they're actually making, how much profit they're making, they're at a price to earnings ratio of about 230 times. So that's trailing P ratio. Forward P ratio is about 107 times. So obviously Square stock is expecting explosive growth because people are valuing it so high right now. For example, if they, let's say they continue to make the same amount of money that they do every single year, it would take 230 years to make back your money on this stock. Now, obviously that sounds ridiculous, but you know, forward P ratios, which is next year is only 108 times, which means they're practically looking to double from next year. And hopefully, you know, as years go on, they double again. Maybe that brings it down to 50, 25, 13, and then you can kind of get all the way down to a regular valuation in just a couple of years. Or at least that's just the idea of why, you know, you can have companies with such high valuations without the markets just crashing because the company is consistently, you know, trying to bring huge growth. And we're going to go over those numbers and make sure they are doing exactly what we think they're doing. That way, maybe we can see, you know, what they're going to do into the future. I do also want to add one more additional statistic right before we jump into those growth numbers. And that is that they have $5.6 billion in cash with $6.1 billion in debt. Now to really understand Square's business model, they really run off two different products. One is Square's Cash App, and then the other one is their seller ecosystem. Now, firstly, with Cash App, really their service is that they allow people to put money into their, you know, their platform, the Cash App platform, and then they can transact money like or send money and transfer money to other peers that also have this app. This service also comes with zero delays, absolutely free transactions and no account minimums. It also has huge layers of security behind it. So instead of you having to give like your email address to somebody like a stranger that might want to pay you for something that you have right then and there, you only have to give them your secure cash sign and then they can just send you that amount of money without them needing to get any of your personal information. And Cash App, like I said, is a freemium service, but there's a lot of ways that they can make money through either charging businesses or merchants that accept Cash App or these sorts of things without actually charging, you know, the direct consumer. And there are some actual premium services on there that, you know, they do accept either service or subscription revenue, but it's, it's small compared to the amount of revenue that they get from their actual businesses. Now, Square is quite unique in the way that they show two-year compounded annual growth rates right now. This is important because obviously this shows one year prior to the pandemic as well as one year into the pandemic. This is super awesome to see because then it allows us to see how the business has been doing before and after. And obviously alongside that, they also do give year-over-year -year data as well. So we're going to go over both those statistics on practically all the information that we're going to talk about today. So just starting off with Cash App's revenue right now, this is going to go off their Q2 2021 financial statements. First, with revenue, they did three 3.3 billion dollars which was up 177 percent year over year and additionally their two-year compounded annual growth rate was 258 percent which is just mind-blowingly huge and these are how we can get you know these crazy high PE ratios like 230 times is because if they continue to grow like this you're going to make your money back very very quickly along with that cash app did about 550 million dollars in gross profits which was 94 percent up year over year as well as 128 percent on their two-year compounded annual growth rates which is another you know mind-blowing statistic but the difference between those revenues and those gross uh, you know profits means 
means that they had a lot more higher, you know, expenses to get this new money because obviously if it was equal and they were doing the same amount of business that they would be up, you know, 258% and not 128. So it is great, but it is not as good as the revenue makes it out to be. But even with some of those numbers aside, like some of these, you know, just raw statistics are just crazy. For example, the volume that they processed through their platform went up four times compared to two years ago. This is obviously because there's new customers coming to their platform, but most importantly, this is actually a number that I think is amazing, is that their existing customers were actually what drove a lot of that growth. People are trusting the platform more, they're bringing more money to the platform, they're doing more of their you know financial services through Cash App alone. That means that they like the service, they find it very, very easy and friendly to use, as well as they trust it, you know? Just all these things coming together are really what you wanna see for a long-term growth company that is actually sticky in this market. Being able to acquire new customers is one thing, having them actually grow within your platform is the most important part. That shows satisfaction and that shows trust. And the inflows from, you know, these actual transacting monthly active customers almost doubled compared to the last two years. And I mean, all these numbers are great, but even Square without all these things are just expanding their services in general. For example, Cash App actually got a stock brokerage recently that is seeing massive success. Nearly 4.5 million users held some sort of stock or ETF during the second quarter, which was up three times since just one year ago. And they also noticed that the customers that do end up holding, you know, stocks or ETFs are are way more likely to hold some of their other products like cash card or some of their Bitcoin options. Things that actually generate greater profits for the company, which just leads to huge cross-selling opportunities. All this led to Cash App doing a gross payment volumes of about $4.1 billion in this quarter, which was up 107% year over year. Obviously these are some crazy numbers, but this is only one half of their business. We still have the seller ecosystem, which is another huge total addressable market for their business that they are taking over. And let's go over some of those numbers, it's quite, you know, spectacular. The seller platform was once created just to be able to take payments, whether you're in person or online, for small retail businesses. It was very quick and very secure for small businesses to use, and they also did amazing advertising, like giving out those chip readers for absolutely free for people to, you know, tap their cards on and these sorts of things, which allowed them to grow their business so fast. But that's only what they started out with. They've now expanded into a full variety of products. That's why they call it the seller ecosystem. Now they have products like Square Savings, where instead of actually just transacting with this business and the money going to either PayPal or some other, you know, uh, financial institution, it goes directly to Square's actual savings and checking accounts, which actually have, you know, real transit and real routing numbers. The businesses can also get like actual Square debit cards that they can pay for expenses, as well as actually pay employees through their Square payroll. All the accounts are FDIC insured and as legit as it could possibly get. And that word ecosystem is really important, okay? Because whenever you offer a service, service where you're one, you know, sort of block in a chain of different events that have to happen to make, you know, something like a transaction like this occur. Whenever you have the ecosystem, you control everything. You know, if someone comes up to pay with a cash app on the Square ecosystem, which it is able to do, they actually do just take a cash app as well. And then you control the actual payment, the storage of the actual money and the payroll out to the employees and everything. That's what a full ecosystem is. And it's very important to understand whenever you're a business, whenever you control a full ecosystem, you have pricing power. Now see, pricing power is extremely important in business and not a lot of people talk about it on YouTube. Now to use a really good example, I'm gonna say airlines, okay? For example, there's nothing really that separates from you getting onto a Delta or an American Airlines or a WestJet or anything like that other than price for the most part, okay? And so the margins on these businesses have to say extremely low because that's what's gonna get you customers. It only really depends on who who's gonna offer you the lowest price. You also see problems like this arising with things like Lyft or Uber. There's not a whole lot of actual, uh, you know, pricing power available because people just choose the cheapest option. Some people even have both apps on their phone and they double check the prices before they go, you know, to any destination. Now this is where ecosystems become so, so important because whenever you own every single step to a certain transaction, you choose the price of the actual product, right? If you own from the top to, you know, the, the financial action actual transaction software to then actually holding the money, giving the certain interest rates on that money, everything like that, you set the bottom line. Okay, so that means that you set the profit margins at 30%. You make it seem like this is the regular amount. For example, Apple does that. They have amazing pricing power and they set their app, like for every dollar that's made on the app store, you know, Apple takes about 30% of that. 
Whenever you compare that to other businesses, that is such an like rip your eyeballs out amount of money. They take 30% of your revenue. But whenever you compare it to other options, like that's your only option. So you don't really have another, you know, uh, place to play ball. That's your only place. So you accept that 30% cut right? So people don't get upset at the actual price that you're willing to pay. It's that the price difference compared to the competition. When there is no competition, you own the ecosystem, you set the price. That was an extremely long-winded way of me saying that I am very happy with ecosystems and the way that Square is trying to make them. Jack Dorsey is no dummy and he's making this, you know, this product very, very, like extremely compelling. And I know a lot of the money is on the cash app side, but the seller ecosystem is, if not more important, as important uh, as Cash App. I think it's an extremely, extremely important side that people do not look at that often because of the massive success from Cash App. And right now they're slowly taking this business more and more globally. Right now all the, you know, the success that we're seeing on Square is mainly in, you know, places like America and Canada. Now, actually, just, just recently, they just announced that they're going to be spreading an actual beta to like Spanish speaking businesses. And they have so much more to grow and it's also a very, very compelling part of the business as well. Just how much more they can expand into other regions of the world and really take this business internationally. And they're seeing all sorts of statistics improve. Like their overall amount of gross payment volumes that's going through their platform is increasing for those actual, you know, those payments, which allow sellers to have higher and higher retention rates on their platform. These are all statistics that we're seeing on their platform, which means not only are the merchants actually growing on their platform, and if they're growing, they're not gonna leave. And so the, the retention staying, you know, they're, they're, they're getting more and more customers, they're still staying and they're growing. These are great, great statistics. Those are like, you know, the three main points in this growth triangle. And it's why we're seeing such high P ratios in this business once again. And all of this is leading to, you know, two main statistics in their numbers, which is uh, generating revenue of about $1.3 billion, which is up 81% year over year, as well as a two year compounded annual growth rate of 23%. Now that is still a very extremely good compounded annual growth rate, but it's nothing like we're seeing on Cash App just because, you know, with the pandemic, everything like this, there's not a whole lot of retail business, but it does not mean that it's not an extremely important part of their business. Plus, I mean, 81% year over year growth is nothing to scoff at either, but let's go into gross profits, for example. With gross profits, we saw about $580 million, which is up 85% year over year, which also led to a two year compounded annual growth rates of 30%, which is still nothing to scoff at at all. You know, most businesses that I try to invest in, I'm trying to get those types of numbers, which just tells you sort of how much Cash App is actually growing in these mind-boggling compounded annual growth rates. I mean, this, this app is just taking over and even their seller ecosystem is not doing bad at all either. Like these are really the two main pillars of the business and they're doing both excellently. So let's take all those numbers that we got from their Cash App as well as their seller ecosystem, combine it all up with all their additional subsidies We'll talk about the rest of the additional news and let's get a full picture of these numbers. Total net revenue was just shy of $4.7 billion, which was actually up 143% year over year. Gross profits were about $1.1 billion, up 91% year over year, which in total throughout both of their businesses, they transacted about $42.8 billion in gross payment volume. That was up 88% year over year. Let me just point out one more cool statistic, although not extreme extreme, but it's still very, very cool to see, is that whenever we're seeing gross payment volumes of like up 88%, where gross profits are up 91%, that difference should actually be the same, but what they're doing is they're actually getting better at making more money out of the money that's actually getting paid to them, which is an amazing statistic. We don't want to see red numbers where that's actually going down. It's good to see that we're actually making more money on the money that we're actually transacting. Another sort of like green check mark on Square's ability to hold up, you know, a P ratio that is quite this high. Now there's two main acquisitions that actually are happening within this quarter. One actually closed, uh, you know, in this second quarter right now, which was Tidal, which is the, you know, the online music service. I think it's a great acquisition. Acquisition. I think, you know, they're trying to bring a lot of like, you know, real uh, seller ecosystems to a lot of these small business owners, but now they're trying to do this quite the same thing to music producers and sort of the business side of this, you know, whole huge music industry. 
bringing what Square knows about the fintech industry and bringing that over to, you know, the actual music industry, this can lead to a whole lot of new artists and producers and everything wanting to bring their business over to Square because they might be making more money over there. And you know what, whenever that happens, that's what's going to bring new customers. Whenever someone like Drake or something signs an exclusive deal with Tidal to produce his music there because they might offer him some higher amount of money or higher interest rates or something like this on the, you know, the sort of production that he could get there. These sorts of things. Things are, are what changes a business like title and it's what you know Jack Dorsey sees in title itself now the second one is actually rubbing me a little bit the wrong way this is afterpay limited okay they're a buy now pay later service that you know they acquired for nearly 29 billion dollars which I think is just absolutely ridiculous to buy for something that this service that you know square could have made their own version of this software I think that they you know they, there's a lot of data that's coming with this and it's not purely that they just didn't want to do the work I mean obviously I'm not that ignorant to think that, you know, there isn't other things coming with this service, but $29 billion is just a huge, huge price to pay for something of this, you know, quality of business. But I mean, what's the consensus here? I'm sure all you guys want to know. Currently, I do not hold Square stock, okay? I do actually think that there is a huge opportunity here, but with this, you know, price to earnings ratio, it might just be a little too risky for me at this current moment whenever there's other stocks like Skills or Corsair or something like this where I can pour my money into and just feel a little bit more confident on these types of purchases. I mean, I only have so much liquidity, right? So my ability to purchase is not just limited to me purchasing whatever I think could potentially be a good stock. I do need, you know, like the best deals. And right now I think it, it actually goes elsewhere. And I mean, there's also other things that scare me, like the 9% short interest on this company, that's massive for the size of the business, as well as also other things like their shared dilution. It is quite big and Jack Dorsey has only said it's going to go one way and that's up because they want to, you know, attract more talent to the business and everything like that. It's actually going to increase over time. Anyways, that's all for me today, guys. If you guys like the video, I really do appreciate you guys giving a thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see more financial content just like this. That's all for me today. If you stuck around this long, I really do appreciate it. Hope you guys stay safe trading and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now.